don't remember what it is. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is our lineup for today. Thanks everyone for, for joining here today. And so we are gonna be talking about coastal issues. And so we have three presentations. So we have Dr. Holly Michael is gonna kick us off. Uh, she's the director of the Delaware Environmental Institute and the Unidel Fraser Russell Career Development Chair for the Environment. Uh, she's a hydrogeologist and works on a range of projects related to water resources. And we have Dr. Phil Barnes, who's policy scientist at the Institute for Public Administration and an assistant professor in the Biden School of Public Policy and Administration. He's also really active in supporting Delaware communities through initiatives like Rascal, but also working directly with towns on their planning initiatives. And then we have Dr. Jerry Hush, who's the coordinator for the UD Extension Climate Change Coordination Initiative, DECI. Uh, is that how you're saying that one? DECI? All right. Hey. Um, also brings a wealth of experience in consulting to support complex organizations and networks and is going to be talking to us about efforts to sort of map the adaptation and climate networks in this space. So I've asked each of the, the speakers to present for 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll have, we can have some clarifying questions, but we'll have Q&A at the end or a discussion at the end after we hear about what everyone's working on. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing that slide and I will turn it over to Holly to kick us off. Thanks, Siders. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. This will be fun. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, get the slideshow. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me. Um, it's great to engage with the Hub. You guys are doing great things. I'm trying to move my Zoom thing around so it's not in the way. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a few of the projects that we're doing related to climate change and would love to hear your thoughts and potential for collaborations or anything like that. Um, hopefully the slides will advance. There we go. Okay, so I'm a, as Cyrus mentioned, I'm a hydrogeologist. So I work on groundwater resources and um, most of the work that I do is coastal, and I think of coastal groundwater as being squeezed between the land and the sea. And so in this representation, you can see the light blue is the fresh groundwater, and we have pressures on land, contaminants, you know, from our agriculture, from our uh, municipalities and our industries, but we also have this massive source of contamination, which is the ocean. And so uh, in many ways, our, our fresh groundwater resources are, are, are really being squeezed and more and more so as populations increase. So today I'm gonna talk about um, saltwater intrusion rather than the other sources of, of pollution in um, coastal groundwater. So thinking about mechanisms of salinization of coastal groundwater, we often look at um, cross sections like this where we have fresh groundwater on land and we have saline groundwater under the sea. And typically we think of them as separated by a, a freshwater saltwater interface, which I'm drawing here as being really um, thin, but it can, it can be really wide. Um, and it's not always exactly in this place, but the, the reason that it's at an angle like this and the reason that it's you know, at the coast is that um, the fresh groundwater is more buoyant than the saline groundwater. So there's a density difference here. And so the Fresh groundwater, groundwater kind of uh, floats on, on the saline groundwater, you might say. And so I think of coastal groundwater as kind of a seesaw between land and sea, right? So if you upset that balance in any way, that interface is going to move. And it can move inland because you have less recharge on land or because you're pumping the fresh groundwater. And it, it can also... Um, move due to sea level rise. So if you, if you, you know, Woodstock goes up, then, then that, that lateral intrusion, that movement of that freshwater saltwater interface in the subsurface will move landward. And then with sea level rise, you can also get vertical intrusion of water, again, because this, the saltwater is denser than the freshwater, it wants to sink and uh, ruin those freshwater resources. And the other way we can get salinization is with o ocean surges and flooding, again, causing this vertical infiltration into previously fresh water. So what's the role of climate change? Well, of course, this land sea balance level rise, but also climate change induced changes in precipitation and temperature that change recharge. Migration of the coastline, which is gonna inundate previously fresh areas, uh, the ocean surges that we have now will extend further inland. 
but also storms are um, are increasing in frequency and intensity. And, and there are other hydrologic changes that can affect salinization, like the elevation of the water table. And we only need a tiny bit of seawater to ruin our freshwater resource. You'll taste it at about 1% and that can start to hurt crops. So it damages, you know, not only our water resources, but also our ecosystems. And this is making the news. So many of you may have seen ghost forests in the news, both in our local uh, news journal, but also all along the Atlantic coast. This is happening where marshes are migrating into forests. The trees die and then, you know, it takes them a while to fall down. So they become bleached and, and they look like these ghostly forests. And they're just stark reminders of how our, our ecosystems are responding to climate change rapidly. And it's not just our forests, but also our agricultural fields, again, making headlines across the Mid-Atlantic. And these effects both in the ag fields and the forests are occurring due to two main mechanisms, one of which is flooding. So even if it's fresh water, if the groundwater table is too shallow, you don't have the unsaturated zone to support the roots and um, effects of salt. Uh, so this is just an example of sort of a burned out zone of, of um, agricultural field. We see this all over the place. Often we see salt crusts. Uh, Pinky Mondal actually looks at these from space. <laughs> she can use remote sensing to map them. So, so they're big. Um, and it's not just a local problem, but it's global. This is a map of cropland and yellow and red. And red is the cropland globally within 100 kilometers of the coastline. That's about 20% of our global cropland. We have a billion people living within 10 meters of sea level, 230 million people living with just, within just one meter of sea level. Um, and we see, you know, these are just a smattering of saltwater intrusion studies that are, you know, some of, you know, just a few of hundreds and hundreds or thousands all over the world. So, um, okay, to get to some of our projects, um, well, I forgot to start my timer, but tell me if I'm going long, Cider. So we have one that's Project Wicked, some of you may have heard about. It's an NSF EPSCoR Track 1 project, a collaboration among UD, Delaware State, and Dell Tech. We're looking at threats to Delaware water quality and specifically focusing on salinization and nutrient over enrichment. And what we're trying to do is develop solutions to mitigate the human, agricultural, and natural pressures that threaten the water quality of Delaware. And so my piece is mostly looking at saltwater intrusion. We're focusing on Greater Dover. We're doing a lot of monitoring of um, the ag fields that butt up against the salt marshes. And we're also doing modeling of saltwater intrusion. And um, we're interested in the Dover area in large part because you have multiple users of groundwater and they're diverse. So you have irrigated agriculture smack up against the city of Dover. You have um, uh, the power plant that uses a lot of groundwater. The, the geologic system is, is fairly complex and, you, and we're also interested in behavioral feedback. So not just, okay, let's put sea level rise into our model and see what happens, but also thinking about how land use might be changing, how people are changing uh, the decisions that they make about their water use as they see changes happening due to climate change. So we're collaborating, I should say, with some experimental economists on that, Leah Palm Forster and Lucy Z at, at UD. We have a, a project funded by the USGS working with the National Parks uh, Service, um, looking at storm surge effects on water salinity particularly as it relates to coastal forest mortality. And we're looking at, um, in particular, Fire Island, New York, and Sandy Hook, New Jersey, where there are these endangered maritime holly forests um, that had um, a huge amount of die-off after Hurricane Sandy. And so Parks and USGS want to understand what are these mechanisms that are driving it? What can we expect in the future? Is this kind of a one-off die-off, or do we really need to protect uh, these these ecosystems. And then on Assateague Island, um, they have, uh, they've had a pine beetle infestation that has killed off a lot of their pine trees. And they hypothesize that this might be due to salinity stress that allows the pine beetles to infest. So we're doing monitoring there. We're also doing some modeling. So this is an example of the kind of modeling where we do, we can simulate coupled surface water and groundwater. I'm showing them separate here just so you can see. And what I'll show you, this green would be um, the ocean. So you'll see a storm surge and that will flush back into the ocean. And then this is the aquifer. 
The gray is fresh water. This is that interface. And this is the offshore where we have saline water, red is saline. And so you'll see it infiltrate. So here's here's the surge, goes up, it comes back. These time steps are, are short, it'll start to get longer. You can see that there's some pooling, then it infiltrates, the salt water uh, sinks down because it's heavier than the fresh water. And then it takes, now we're at 12,000 days, 13, 15, it takes years and years to flush out. And we're not just focused at, at a, a few local areas. We're also trying to put this into a large scale context, um, thinking about what the factors are that control vulnerability to these salinization processes and how we might map that over the East and Gulf coasts. And then the last project I want to mention is um, a relatively new project funded by NSF. It's a coastal critical zone network that is a collaboration among UD and, and six other institutions. Um, and the idea is that, that we have concurrent changes in water and chemical cycling that are altering the function of what we call the coastal critical zone. Um, and, and so we're quantifying these coupled processes and feedbacks to understand how shifts in the transition zone, so formation of ghost forests and agricultural salinization will translate into changes in cycling fluxes and storage of elements at the land sea margin. And so what are the key drivers of these changes? I already touched on these, so I'll go quickly, but if this is a cross section where we have a marsh going up into a forest, uh, in this case, the forest is starting to die off. Um, we have slow hydrologic processes for example, sea level rise that can cause a, a relatively slow response in the water table that can lead to groundwater flooding and slow seawater intrusion. And we also have fast hydrologic processes like high tides and storm surges that, you know, that cause rapid salinization. And the way we're thinking about this is if, if, if this, this is a plot of salinity versus either time or space distance from mean high, high water, if plants become stressed in a certain salinity zone, let's say it's this pink zone, then if you have fast processes that go up into the stress zone and back down quickly, maybe you know you don't get a lot of ecological change. The, the crops and the forest can deal with it. But if you superimpose on that sea level rise, then you spend more and more time up in that stress zone and, and you'll hit a tipping point where you really start to see ecosystem failure. So that's what we're looking at. And so we're thinking about how we take those fast and slow hydrologic processes. We look at the ecological and geomorphological response. And what do I mean by that? Well, ecological response, of course, the trees are dying, but when the trees die, then their, their roots die too. And then you can get root zone collapse, which is then feeding back into, um, lowering the land surface elevation, which will be a positive feedback with flooding. We're also interested in biogeochemical response. So when we get uh, excess salinity, we change redox conditions with changing water table, we can release um, carbon and nutrients uh, and other contaminants that are currently stored in those soils. So we have sites um, across the Delmarva, we have paired forest and agriculture sites along the um, Delaware Bay coast, the Atlantic coast, and the Chesapeake Bay. So these are just two of our examples. This is Milford Neck in Delaware, and this is our Virginia farm site. Um, this is some drone footage just to give you a sense of what these sites look like. This is the Virginia Coast Long-Term Ecological Research Reserve. And so you can see we're in healthy forests now. And as we pan out, you start to see these zones where the trees have died and it's patchy at first. So this is what we consider our transition zone. And then really you start to get full on ghost forest as you transition into the healthy marsh. And this is actually a good thing, right? Because marsh ecosystems are, are really important for in all kinds of ways. They give us lots of ecosystem services, but it's also a really stark reminder that, that um, things are changing. And so we're instrumenting these sites. We have hydrological, ecological, biogeochemical, and geomorphological measurements. We're coupling this with modeling. I don't have time to talk about all of it, but happy to talk later. But here's the idea is that we instrument from healthy crop to healthy marsh and healthy marsh to healthy forest across these dying transition zones. And we're looking at, uh, you know, we have, we have wells with, connectivity, temperature, depth recorders. We have multi-depth redox sensors, soil moisture sensors, pore water samplers, et cetera. 
um, and ag fields, but then also in the forest. And in forests, we have set flux sensors and band, band andrometers to really all at the same time with sensors looking at 15 minute changes. How, how are these changes occurring and, and in response to what? And the idea is that if we can tie together the physics of the hydrology to these other aspects, then we can use physics-based models like this one um, to infer the other changes that are happening. So this is a model we developed for, um, this is the St. Jones Research Resort with St. Jones Marsh, so the St. Jones River and the marsh next to it. And what I'm showing are water levels um, that are changing. And so what we did in this case was we simulated sea level rise to understand how marshes themselves are going to change in the future. And we looked at marsh zonations, which are ecological and also hydrological zonations. And I'll just be quick here, I'm almost done. But um, the idea is that we can look at, at different scenarios of relative sea level rise. And if this is our current um, scenario, zero sea level rise, say, we have a certain amount of upland, we have a certain amount of subtidal marsh, and then, and then different zones. And so what you can see here is with sea level rise, we kind of have a tipping point, a little less than a half a meter, where you really start to drown the marsh. Um, and then also you, there's kind of a tipping point around there too, where you lose a lot of upland, you get marsh migration. And because different amounts of carbon are stored in these different zones, we can use that to estimate, for example, the carbon sequestration potential of the marsh and how it might change. With sea level rise initially, you get more carbon storage, but then again, a tipping point where you start to lose that ecosystem surface. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're up to. We're looking at, at seawater intrusion, how it threatens coastal groundwater resources and ecosystems. We're characterizing the physical drivers and time scales of salinization, and we're linking those to water resource vulnerability, ecological change, biogeochemistry, and geomorphology, and hopefully thinking about what those implications are for management. Thanks for listening. Thanks. That it, that is really striking to see the uh, the time that it matters, right? I mean, I heard about the sea level rise and the water overwash, but to but to see that that time duration that it really affects people is is fascinating. Um, well, I'm going to move straight on though to Phil Barnes, uh, and then we can we can come back for more discussion at the end once we've heard everybody, because I'm hoping we'll get some cross cross talk themes that'll be more interesting to dig into. Yeah. So Phil, I'll hand it over to you. Take it away. All right. <clears throat> Okay, uh, oops, I need to share a screen. Okay, we see this? Yep. All right, so, um, so the project that I'm gonna present on is something that I did uh, uh, in 2021, 2022. It really comes on the back of research. This is an applied project I'm gonna talk about. There was some more, um, applied research but more academic uh, that happened in 2020 2021 where i looked at uh, what was happening in the climate adaptation uh in mitigation space in delaware at the local level so what were communities doing in delaware to adapt to and mitigate climate change um, that research is available it's online i'm not going to talk about it the long uh story short is that they're not doing a whole lot uh, they're doing some planning, they're updating their floodplain ordinances because they have to, uh, and, but in terms of proactive mitigation adaptation measures at the local level, there's not a lot happening. Uh, that research identified capacity, which is not going to surprise anybody, um, uh, financial capacity, human resource capacity, technical capacity to be able to deliver on climate uh, policy. The policy wasn't happening. Uh, and so on the piggybacking off of that 2020-2021 research, DENREC funded this project, which is a pilot project that we worked with the city of Lewis um, to help them work through some climate policies. So I'm going to go through, um, I'm not going to go through, this isn't a policy talk, this is more of a process talk um, about how to engage communities on climate policy. And I'll, I'll, I'll contrast a, an effort that was underway in Lewis when we got involved to what we did uh, after we got involved, okay? So um, very briefly, uh, just some conceptual and theoretical stuff here because this is a, a 
semi-academic audience. So um, Deborah Stone, she wrote a famous book, The Policy Paradox. In the book, she talks about um, how policy development, uh, at least in democratic uh, uh, societies, has to be community driven. Uh, she talks about in that environment, uh, information that we use to make policy choices is always incomplete, contested, ambiguous. Um, she argues that groups and not individuals are the catalyst for change. And within those groups, we all do this, we balance our self-interest with our public interest. So for example, we all want really great public schools, but at the same time, we don't wanna pay taxes, right? We want um, clean air, but sometimes we wanna drive our, uh, our gas vehicles at the same time, right? So we have these general public interests that we have, but they often compete with our, with our self-interest, okay? Um, and so what do we see when we apply uh, Stone's sort of theoretical framework to climate change? Well, climate policies, obviously anything that happens at the local level is gonna impact the whole community. And it's, so it should be determined by a community. Um, really any policy, particularly in the climate space is going to really challenge that self and public interest. And I'll get into some of that. Um, they're gonna duke it out and there's gonna be some internal and group conflicts there. And we need to be comfortable with uncertainty, particularly as it relates to climate change. Holly just presented, we've got saltwater intrusion. We know a lot about atmospheric chemistry and anticipated impacts and that, but within those, the probabilities of what and how we're gonna um, feel climate change, particularly uh, with what happens globally. I mean, COP is, they're, they're in Indonesia right now. So, uh, or no, uh, Sharm El Sheikh, wherever they are, Biden was in Indonesia. Um, so it depends on it depends on what happens globally with policy. So how much uncertainty are we talking about? Here is the probabilistic sea level rise scenarios for the city of Lewis. Uh, this is from John Callahan a couple of years ago, right? We're looking at anywhere from between like the 50% flip a coin, we're uh, going to get somewhere around three feet. It's going to be above or below that. There's a 5% chance we could get five feet. And there's a 95% chance, chance we're going to get... Um, a uh, foot and a half. Okay, so how do you how do you make policies in this kind of situation when you're asking people to, you know, change the rules of the game, and they say, all right, well, for what future? And this is what you present to them, right? So Deborah Stone saying that information is incomplete. This is what she's talking about. All right. So uh, as I said, uh, we were working with Denrec funded this project. It's called the Resilient Communities Partnership. It's an annual technical assist, or it's an annual assist community assistance program offered by Denrec, specifically coastal management program. Um, in 2021, 2022, uh, this Resilient Communities Partnership was scoped to offer direct policy technical assistance to a community in Delaware. Denrec contracted with us at the Institute for Public Administration at the Biden School to deliver this. And uh, in early in 2021, the city of Lewis was selected as the community uh, that we would work with. Uh, those of you that know Lewis know that it's a beautiful town, but it's also incredibly vulnerable. So here are some photos of significant flooding uh, in Lewis. The town is incredibly vulnerable, right on the bay. Um, but the flooding, um, as most of us know, the flooding actually doesn't come from the bay or the ocean side, it comes from the backside, right? So Lewis has this canal that goes down to Rehoboth, and a lot of the flooding in Lewis comes from the canal and Canary Creek. Um, so Lewis is incredibly vulnerable, and in 2020, 2021, before we got involved, they were trying to do something about this. So the planning commission in the city of Lewis created the sea level rise subcommittee, and this subcommittee was composed essentially of three dudes, um, all technical experts on sea level rise and planning, uh, members of the planning commission, they all were very comfortable with regulating uh, developments. So it was a small group of dudes that were meeting uh, on Zoom in Lewis um, with very little public input. The meetings were open and available to the public, but there was not a whole lot of community engagement with their deliberation. Um, there was potential conflicts of interest. I'm not going to get into it, but the Board of Public Works is in Lewis is separate from the city and administration. Um, there was also a lack of uh, record and um, and not uh, transparency was an issue with this um, with this committee. So this committee met for a year. This on the right hand side is a screenshot of their uh, resiliency ordinance that they drafted. Um, this ordinance. Uh, 
the first recommendation, uh, first of several recommendations that they offered um, after a year of deliberation and looking at this was to reduce lot coverage from 65% to 50% within the 100 year floodplain and add an additional 20 inches of freeboard on top of the 18 inches uh, of freeboard that Lewis has already in their floodplain ordinance. So if you are doing substantial uh, damage improvement, or if you have a new build in the city of Lewis and you're in the 100 year floodplain, you would have to comply with this resiliency ordinance, which would reduce your lot coverage. You could build currently in Lewis, you can build 65% of the lot. They wanted to reduce that to 50 to reduce stormwater runoff, right? Reduce flooding. And you got to bump your lowest elevation floor up an additional 20 inches. Uh, uh, so your your height of your building is going up to account for sea level rise. So this was the recommendation that the committee, the subcommittee offered. They released it to the public and it did not go well. So there was a public hearing uh, on Zoom. The public caught wind of this and it was not very good. Um, uh, I was on the Zoom call. The public really objected to the process of the committee. They said, oh, well, it's not... Um, wasn't transparent, we weren't involved, they objected to the substance, they didn't like having the lot coverage reduced. Uh, there was individuals on the call that pro provided public comments that really, uh, I would say, offered junk climate science um, recommendations. And there was a clear uh, articulated conflict between that self and public interest. So the community said, yes, we agree with climate uh, policy in, in general, but, like we want to do something better for the community, but you want to reduce my lot coverage by 50% uh, or by 15%. And that's going to impact my property value. Right. Uh, so here's that self and public interest type of thing going on. Okay. So after this uh, public hearing, it was very clear that there was no path forward for the sea level rise subcommittee and its resiliency ordinance. The mayor, um, this is when we got involved. Uh, and the mayor decided essentially to reset the process. So they sunset the sea level rise committee and we started by engaging and listening to the Lewis community. And the way that we did that was with community listening sessions. So um, right off the bat, we held three listening sessions on three different, three different days and three different times of day. I don't know if you can see these, but it's June 8th, June 9th, June 10th, 1.15 p.m., 7.45 p.m. and 5.45 p.m., right? So like, depending on when you're working, when you're available, um, we tried to have a, an opportunity for everyone to, to show up to this and to provide their input. Really what we were doing was trying to gauge where the community was at in terms of their concerns for Lewis. What, do you, what is it that you fear or are worried about in terms of your future, right? We created an online survey so people that couldn't attend one of these three sessions could fill out forms online. We made a lot of effort to get the word out. There was an article in Delaware Public Media. We sent out newsletters, we tabled at events. Like we got the word out and tried to really market these listening sessions. Uh, over a hundred people participated or submitted comments to the form online. And uh, uh, it did not surprise us, although we weren't sure, we didn't wanna make any assumptions that sea level rise and flooding were top concerns from the community, okay? So that sort of validated, and immediately here, we, 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 were, we got validation that this was something that the community felt was a, um, an issue and that needed to be worked on. So at this point, the mayor decided to impanel uh, what's called the LECR, the Lewis Executive Committee on Resiliency. And this um, was <clears throat> the selection, there's 11 members of the, the committee these are um, Lewis residents and stakeholders, geographically diverse within the community. So you had some members who were right on the water, some members who were inland. You had members from the um, real estate uh, and commercial uh, interests. You had engineers. You had uh, public officials. There was a member of council that was on the committee, and there was a member of the Board of Public Works. So there was, uh, and the planning director. Um, so there was really this diverse range of economically not diverse because Lewis is economically pretty wealthy, homogeneous, racially not diverse because again, it's pretty white, but in terms of geography, gender, and stakeholder interests, and I will say politics. There was an intentional effort to select a group of 11 individuals from the community that represented diverse political ideologies. Um, Okay, so, so nobody will argue or could argue that this committee was cherry picked to go in one particular political and or policy direction. 
that is completely, that would be a complete mischaracterization of this committee. So IPA, what our role was, was to help this committee come to some policy recommendation, okay? That was the charge. So the mayor's charge was you guys meet, you're gonna come up with some policy recommendations and we're gonna bring these, uh, we're gonna draft them into ordinance form, we're gonna bring them to a public comment, we're, and then we're gonna try and um, get them adopted by council. So we started meeting bi-monthly. This was in the summer of 2021. Uh, the first thing we did with this committee is we spent many months, we met twice a month, we spent many months actually bringing the members of this committee up to speed on climate change, flooding, what it means to be living in a coastal community, where to get information, the things that are happening in the Lewis community, the plans and ordinances that are already on the books. And we did not determine this curriculum. I want to, and when I say trust the process, the reason why our approach to this was let the committee figure this out and tell us where they want to go. We weren't going to be the public administrators behind the scenes that were pulling the strings and trying to push the committee in one direction or another. We really let them determine the directions and the information uh, that they wanted to get. So they determined the curriculum and we brought in the experts um, or we presented the, uh, the information to them. Okay, but it was really their choice. Then we went through a policy deliberation phase where we um, researched, identified 14 different policy options actually uh, that they could that they could um, as evaluate and assess and, and deliberate on. Um, they also uh, brought some options to us. Okay, um, and it was very clear within the committee there were two teams. There was the team that was like let's go big or go home. That's what I'm calling team be bold. And then there was the team don't rock the boat. So there was a group within the committee that was like, well, you know, we want to do things, but we don't want to push it too far. Okay. Um, and so we, they looked at 14 different policy options. I'm not going to get into them, uh, but we voted and we narrowed those options down to six ample time. We also wanted to ensure we got the word out about these meetings. We had, um, both in person, you could you could zoom in, or you could go to council chambers where the, um, there was a Zoom. Um, uh, it was being live streamed, so you could show up in person or on Zoom to provide public comment. We had a lot of public comment um, at each meeting, particularly at the beginning of the committee process. Okay, so uh, here is the six shortlist candidates for the. Um, policy options. And what we had the, the committee do was their own policy analysis. That is something that I could have easily done on my own behind the scenes to conduct this policy analysis after they uh, selected their short list of options. But we listened to the committee as they were deliberating on the initial list of 14. And they would say things like, well, this is going to cost too much and we may not get the benefit. So that's a criteria I mean, I teach policy analysis, right? So like, this is a criteria that you can use to evaluate your different policy options. So as they were deliberating on the 14, I was jotting down the different criteria that they were using to judge these uh, as in their initial deliberation phase. So then I, we presented them with this grid and we were like, look, these are the things that you've already talked about. Here's your short list of options. Let's dive deeper into this. So we actually spent um, three, two meetings or three meetings having the committee work through and fill in this matrix uh, about you know, what is the area of impact for landscape standards? Well, that would be the entire city, right? What is the area of impact for the freeboard? Well, that would be the 100 year floodplain. So we let them work this through. And that was really helpful because then they could see the strengths and weaknesses of the different policy options on their own instead of us saying this and then uh, are having to try and convince them or argue with them about it, right? They came to these conclusions on their own. Uh, these are the two that they picked as a finalist. Uh, so the two recommendations that came out of the committee are to create a resiliency fund and a real estate disclosure. Um, do I have, I don't think I have the details of these. Basically the resiliency fund, they're gonna raise revenue and uh, have it as a rainy day fund, no pun intended. Uh, so one of the, uh, they wanna generate a half a million dollars a year, the city of Lewis does, accumulate that over many, many years and have money on hand to match federal grants, for example, right? Uh, so a lot of these grants, uh, federal grants require a community match. 
they don't have that sitting around, if they have a resiliency fund, they can dip into that for a match. They can use it to acquire properties that are vulnerable. They can use it for green infrastructure. They can use it for any number of things, All right? And then the real estate disclosure policy, that option is if you are buying a property in Lewis, you need to be presented with a disclosure early on in the process, not at the signing table, that your property may be vulnerable to increased risk of flooding because of sea level rise. And here's some here's some uh, websites you can go to evaluate your risk and learn more about it, right? So that people that are buying property in Lewis aren't just coming in um, and not knowing what they're getting into. Uh, you notice that increased freeboard and reduced lot coverage were on the, that was the two recommendations from the original sea level rise subcommittee, right? They made it to the shortlist, but team don't rock the boat, one out. Uh, and these are the two finalists that were offered as, um, as recommendations from the committee. So we had a very hands-off process. I will say it wasn't completely hands-off. Um, I did have to manage climate skeptics. There were, there were some climate skeptics on the committee that pretty much every meeting would say whatever they had just read in the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. And so it, rather than trying to challenge uh, those individuals during the uh, sessions, um, I had offline conversations with them and I didn't call them out. I asked them to come in and say that their voices were powerful on this committee, which they very much were and that um, uh, the committee is doing a civic duty and they're here to make decisions on the community. And if we continually debate the climate science, we're not gonna get to that end goal of making a recommendation. And so be courteous to everybody's time and uh, use your strength to, to really drive the conversation forward and let's get to a policy. So didn't call them out, but called them in, which after those conversations, we, it was much smoother sailing. Um, we did refuse some requests from the committee. One of the things was an analysis of reducing lot coverage. So they wanted to know, look, if we shrink it from 65 to 50%, will it actually have an impact? We said, that's an excellent question. We don't know, but we don't have the time and money to figure that out right? Be comfortable with uncertainty, exactly what Deborah Stone is saying. Um, we don't know the impact, the total impact that we'll have. And they did want to hear from more experts, but we were up against the clock, so we had to keep moving forward. Um, so the next steps, finally, the next steps for the city of Lewis, uh, they made the recommendations, the LECR has been dissolved, we wrote a policy brief uh, that we presented to the community, draft ordinances are ongoing right now. Um, so they're starting with a real estate disclosure ordinance that's being drafted by the city solicitor, then it will have a public hearing, um, then it needs to get approved by city council and implemented. Um, I keep messaging Anne-Marie Townsend, who's the city manager in Lewis, about once a month saying, hey, what's going on? Uh, are we moving forward with this? Because we're not involved anymore, right? Once the lecker was dissolved and we submitted our policy brief, we're done with, with our contract, um, technically, but I still keep pushing to make sure <laughs> we're moving forward. And then there's um, <clears throat> those 12 policy options that weren't, that didn't make the final cut. There's another hazard mitigation committee within the city of Lewis that is uh, deliberating on those. So it's not like they've totally fallen off the wayside. Um, they're, they, they have no future. They may have a future, but not right now, maybe in the future. Uh, and I will just say two final things after <laughs> this, get a grant from the Cli Climate Hub to create a class. Thank you, Climate Hub. So there's a new class that's going to be at UD that um, kind of is built off of this project. And I've got this idea that I really want to uh, fund, which is, uh, you know, the climate core um, uh, concept to try to get capacity in these communities. And we'll do that with students, hopefully, if I get some money. So sorry, I probably went way over, but... Um, we should definitely talk more about the climate core to collaborate later on. Yeah. But, but at this point, I do need to turn it over to Jerry so we give uh, her full time to be able to chat first. So. Thanks, Phil. It's, it's fascinating to hear about the process and how people engage with that. Jerry, I'll turn it over to you without further ado. Oh, you're still muted, though. There you are. Yep. Okay. So, okay. Well, thank you both for your the previous conversations, because what I'm going to do actually complements both of them. So I'm going to share my screen also um, for my PowerPoint and to bring into focus the work that I'm doing with um, extension. And let me make sure I get the slideshow. 
Okay, can you folks see this? I just need a thumbs up. Okay, excellent. So my role, um, to start off with, I, I need to preface this with my professional background. I'm a sociologist. So I work to, in some ways, talk a little bit more about what Phil has, has talked about in terms of community engagement. And so I entered um, Extension uh, at the um, request of uh, Jen Folk, who's been very involved with climate change and actually with water issues, um, to take on a one-year project that we're calling the Delaware Extension Climate Change Coordination Initiative. And in that role, what we're going to be talking, what I'm looking at is the ability to work between various, in my language, uh, actors, so that we know that there are um, organizations, DENREC, for example, the university, who are engaged in climate change work, also extension, but it has been very ad hoc. And one of the goals of my the project is to establish who's doing what, where, when, and why. And the goal of that is so that we can better coordinate, uh, collaborate, and communicate between key actors so that not only within the university system of which extension is part in Kenner, but also between the counties, in the state, in the region, and nationally. So this one year project is designed to establish um, at the various levels of each organization, who is doing what. Um, in that sense, we're really focused right now on um, Extension and Delaware, but Extension, because it's part of a, a school at the university, we can't separate ourselves out. And so that's part of the reason why I'm so interested in the hub is that the work going on in the hub, and just as I've learned from two people <laughs> from your, your comments, I have been writing down the names of people who we really need to talk, talk to, because the idea is that we can map out and begin to establish the relationships that are going on. So the objectives of this uh, project is that we want to make sure that we can uh, have evidence-based action, and that will allow us to align and integrate various policies. Certainly what we're learning in Lewis is not going to just be Lewis. It's going to have to do with the whole county. And so it's well, from, at my language, a micro level, this kind of what you dealt with with the process is going to occur over every single level, all the way up to essentially national level, that they're all linked. We want to especially address education and training needs um, because the new, because as climate change becomes more and more discussed, we really need to understand, um, in my language, what the pedagogy is. What are we teaching? We know we have technical training, for instance, water and drought issues, but we also need to deal with people's understanding and their perspective of what's going on. So we have some very deep educational and training needs that need to be addressed. We certainly need to establish partnerships so that there's less redundancy and there's less repetition and there's less um, what I'm calling territoriality because the territory, the land that we live on, there um, is going to be, we can't separate out, um, as we learned this morning, we can't separate the response um, of water intrusion on farmers or on fisher people or this kind of thing. So we really need to be able to understand what is a strong partnership and how can we develop alliances. Um, we need to reserve, we need to have evidence so that we can reduce resource overlaps. And I keep hearing about DENREC, but there are a lot of other state agencies, education, for example, or agriculture that need to be brought into the climate change conversation. And how can we do that? And certainly we need to develop strategies to uh, coordinate information flow. So those are the ultimate goals. Once we get a sense of uh, what I call the socioscape of what's occurring in um, extension, University and then Delaware writ large. So as an overview of where we are, the project started in um, September. And so what we currently have is some background briefing materials that are being sent out to people. And I'm hoping that this kind of conversation will elicit interest. And then I'll be getting emails from everybody <laughs> that will have we'll be able to share the background information. And we've also established a process. And this process we call it's called climate. Um, action Intelligence, CAI, and that process uh, I'm bringing to the university via my work with, within the UN. Uh, most of my work has been with, across various UN agencies, and so I worked with the UN um, Development Pro UNDP Development Program in um, 12 countries in Africa where we brought together data across 
ministries, um, agriculture, environment, so that they could write their national action plans. And so this year long study is very much a method, a methods study of how can we integrate data from multiple sources that's been um, developed in a variety of different places. And so we're using a strategy that allows us to code and work with that material. I'm not going to go into that here, but I would love to do some training with people to, to work with that um, method. So in collecting the data, we're putting it into what we're calling a data repository. It's a big word for right now. We're just simply using an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, again, I'm trying to learn who's doing what at the university and trying to find uh, collaborators who can help us develop a dynamic integrated uh, data repository using the most up-to-date kind of um, uh, uh, technology that's possible. But the data repository is where we are currently coding and storing the information that we're getting. The reason we're developing this is that our goal is that we want to be able to visualize the linkages of what's occurring across various um, entities. And that means that we need to geolocate where that activity is going on. We need to understand if there's complementarity in the language. For instance, are two organizations seeking to uh, partner, but their language and their, their description of what they're doing is completely different and they won't be able to actually work together because they can't talk to each other. Uh, we need to also understand the social network and the relationships between these entities. So, for example, it may sound really good on paper to have people partner up, but they might discover that at, at a procedural level, maybe their, their funding or their, their calendar is so completely off that they really cannot work together. So we need to clarify all the way from strategic level down to what we call procedural level so that we can really begin to um, work to develop partnerships. And we're also doing a time trend analysis so that we can begin to see where policies have been implemented and the impact over time, whether there was actual change. So Phil, again, what you talked about with Lewis is really important. That kind of activity would be put in our repository with a date, with a coding, and uh, with the key actors so that we could see are there what's going on in other, other um, cities in the, in the state. So we could begin to develop partnerships across that kind of conversation. Uh, so that's our goal, is that we have this repository, we're coding the data, we're working on it so that we can ultimately visualize it. I'm actually putting out a request for anybody who knows anyone in different departments who do linguistic analysis, who is the GIS specialist, who does social network analysis so that we can object relations, and who's our time people. I'm, I'm very new to UD. I must admit I'm coming in from another university and also working <laughs> in a, a large organization, so I need to meet people to actually go forward. So the reason we're doing that is that once we get this data organized and we have analyzed it in terms of who's doing what, where, time, place, language, all these kind of um, behind the scenes, we can develop uh, infographics that we can then use to engage with people so that we can show them what's going on at uh, the different levels. And so if you look at this um, uh, diagram, what we're seeking to ach achieve here is to deal with the complexity of climate change adaptation. Um, in my language, it's not a linear process, it's a complex systems process where there will be policy conversations going on simultaneously that farmers are seeking to figure out what to do on their land. So this is designed to deal with the top layer that we call our macro action. Uh, you can see this up here, which is policy work all the way to management. How can we actually engage people together? And how does that affect micro people on the ground, people in, in Lewis or people in farms down, all the way down, uh, down state? So we seek to have these kind of materials be developed for uh, evidence for conversations so that we can um, begin to build um, means to respond to climate change. So what we've done to get us started is, is we established, we've created a couple um, activities, what we're calling the a four questions poll. And I and Siders was uh, uh, active enough that she did our first poll, which we did at Canner. So we have four questions that we're asking people. And I, these are the four questions that I'm using for my key informant interviews. Basically, they're divided into first, how did you learn about or what did you learn about? How did you learn about climate change? What does the term climate change make you think of? What we call thinking. So first is learn, second is think. 
What does it make you feel? So we understand the emotional response. And finally, to get a sense of what people are doing in order in, uh, to respond. So it's a very quick uh, way for us to begin conversations and to learn about people's response. So we did this at the Canterfest. We had um, actually 44 people respond. It was fantastic. We were really impressed. The color coding is that the pink were staff and the green were students. So we'd be able to see who we responded to and we had the questions uh, responded. So we did a real quick word cloud on that. And we were really, really excited to see these patterns emerge from the language. Um, people seem to have learned most uh, through school and the news, it was very evident that news is where they got their information, how they think about it. They're immediately thinking about uh, the, uh, the rising temperatures, the water, disasters, as you can see these terms. And what was most important for us right now is how do they feel about it? And the worried, scared, and anxiety just popped up over and over and over again. There's incredible nervousness and lack of uh, capacity to recognize what I call optimistic potential solutions. And I think that's something that needs to be dealt with. And finally, what do you do about it? Or what are you doing? Again, you can't see this really well on the screen, but for us, what we saw were what I'm calling individualistic responses. I'm buying a new car, I'm recycling, I'm planting plants. And what was important for me, what, what was missing, and that's that policy focus, that we don't have a collective identity in terms of how to respond. So that was the first time we really talked to people. We then did a poll uh, for just extension. Since my mandate is really to begin with um, uh, extension, we sent out a Qualtrics poll, the same thing, four questions, and we got back 88 responses. And again, it's a very busy slide. You can't see it, but the responses were almost identical to what we got from the general uh, response. And then again, the, the people are getting their information from the news, they're thinking about the weather, not the climate, they're thinking about the weather. Um, they're feeling very concerned, anxious, and what are they doing? You can see recycling, planting plants, um, uh, doing more with compost. So from our perspective, the critical issues for us right now is to continue to develop uh, meetings with key informants, which is what I'm engaged in right now. Also, you can tell from my enthusiasm with the Climate Hub, I'm hoping that we can be a key partner and really help develop a university-wide response, which means I'm putting out there that if it would be very, very interesting for us to have, do these four question polls in other colleges to see how people respond in business, for example, or with the arts and humanities. We're not quite sure what's going on, but it would be very, very interesting to be able to compare colleges. And finally, clearly we wanna analyze the repository materials, which means we're go we're, we will go back and analyze uh, key strategic documents. We are going to look at what organizations are using, and that's going to be actually in January and February. And so that's where we are right now. Um, please contact me if you'd like to have a further conversation. I'd very much like to learn more about what's going on in people's areas. And if needed, as I said, it'd be really good to be able to develop this uh, poll across the university. So that's it. So I've speeded through that one. <laughs> so. No, that's great. And, and I, I just can say that the, the hub would be happy to, uh, we can definitely share that with our partners or with our listserv too, if that would help spread the word out there. Well, uh, we're coming up very closely on the end of our scheduled hour. So I know some people may need to jump off, but if our panelists are able to stay for another five minutes or so, it'd be nice just to be able to take some questions. So that'd be really helpful. All right. Well, uh, rather than then asking my questions, because I can always talk to people later, are there questions from the audience? Yeah, Tiana, go for it. Hi, so I have a question for Dr. Barnes. Um, I'm currently working on a project where we've mapped all of the historical properties in Lewis, Delaware, and then we mapped on top of that in ArcGIS sea level rise scenarios ranging from zero feet to 10 feet. And so one of the conclusions of this project is where um, we're looking at what is known about protection of historical properties uh, from climate change. And so I was curious if during your work in Lewis, if you had, uh, if your participants had any uh, mentions about the historic properties in Lewis, especially like the Lewis Historic District that's by downtown. So uh, the short answer is no. Uh, 
you probably know there's a Lewis Historical Society and they're very active and engaged in this. Um, I think there was references to historic properties in the, in the discussion, but I, I think most of what um, the policy conversation was about was, was residential properties uh, like along Cedar Avenue and, and uh, Cedar Street and Bay Avenue, um, and then back along Canary Creek, where there's fewer historic homes. So th the short answer is no. Where on Second Street there, in sort of the downtown Lewis, um, is where probably your 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 map is showing those properties, and and they're less vulnerable than I think some of the the residential and commercial stuff that's down by the canal. Yeah, um, it's actually interesting because the highest cluster of historical properties is on the, I've never been to Lewis, so no, I've only seen it at Google Maps, but there's like a green space yes. on Google Maps, and there's over 100 registered historic properties, but in the event of two feet of sea level rise, we're finding that all access roads will be cut off to that region. Um, yes yeah so so access so yeah you're getting into the, the the weeds of it but like damage to the property might not exist but access to the property is an issue <laughs> so um yeah yeah i actually go ahead and send me an email i did some work in the city of milford a couple years ago where i worked uh historic um uh historic properties and climate uh impacts into their comprehensive plan so I can send you I can send you what we did there and, and maybe give you some some pointers. But it sounds like it sounds like you're doing it very similar to what I did for Milford. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, Tiana and Phil we both need to connect because the, um, there's also a initiative starting out of arts conservation here on campus to look at climate change and heritage in the state. Uh, so you know there, there could potentially be a lot of overlap that'd be interesting. Other other questions from the audience. If not, I mean, I mean, you can think about it, but I'm, I'm going to ask our panelists if you have closing thoughts. What I'm going to ask for is um, collaborations or partnerships you are you're looking for or hoping to find, I guess. It doesn't have to be like specific people, but kinds of Jerry, you mentioned already like some GIS or, or you know, text analysis. But curious uh, if any if you have any particular asks you'd like to make to the group or other people might have suggestions on who we could who we could connect you with further. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate my call for, for support. Uh, part of what makes this project so interesting is that we really are utilizing a method of this climate action intelligence that requires the use of different kinds of software. We don't want it to just be another report with text. We really want to show the relationship between geographic location, for example, with different populations, who people work with, the language. Um, certainly we wanna make sure that we in we're very inclusive because climate change is affecting the, the population in a very significantly different ways, depending on your status and where you and who you are, where you live. So if you know people um, who are doing computing, dealing with comp complex variables and showing multidimensional modeling, I would love to hear about that. If you know anybody who's in language or any linguistics who's doing uh, linguistic analysis, we're really looking for an easy software that we could then go in and analyze text. We're looking for people who are interested in, so we have a GIS call, we have a social network call, we have a linguistics call, and then if you know any historians who are using any kind of software that allows us to uh, develop historical trends. And I really would like to hear from everybody, so thank you. Phil or Holly, any, any calls you'd want to make to close us out? I mean, I'll just say that I'm really excited about, uh, you know, Jerry, what you're doing, sort of getting people to communicate and, and figuring out what everybody's doing. And I think that that, that really needs to be done and, and Phil, you know, the engagement with the community as well. And so as a natural scientist, you know, thinking about how we address these huge problems, uh, you know, clearly partnerships across all the different disciplines and across different institutions and, um, you know, the government, et cetera, is really important. So I just, I, I look forward to hopefully engaging with you all more on these issues and thinking about how um, how we can partner and address them. And, you know, I agree that uh, I'm excited about the hub. Um, and I think this is a, a great way to, to get us all 
together. Everyone's excited about the hub. Yay. <laughs> Phil, anything last words? Yeah, I'll just say I'll just say that you know I'm 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 happy to um, to work with anybody on any of these issues. Uh, at the end of the day, what I really care about is is changing policy because that's what it's going to take. I mean that's that's how we're going to solve the climate crisis is through policy change, and being in the Biden school and having connections to state agencies and local governments, I can help move the policy needle. Um, and I really want the academic community and state partners to work together, particularly the academic community when we have research designs. Um, I will say this until I'm blue in the face. I, I'm happy to par partner with, with um, my colleagues at UD, but only if it's early in the research design process. I don't like being contacted at the 11th hour for broader impacts. Um, and, and then have to scramble to try and figure something out. Um, let's work together early on to fuse the uh, scientific um, and, and scholarly research with application in communities and create information and, and knowledge systems that are usable by layman policymakers. And I can help with that. No, I, I think that's that's awesome. And it's definitely, uh, well, it was originally one of the visions of having these kinds of lunch and learns is to try to to build some of those networks so we're not doing the the last minute, who are my colleagues who work on, <laughs> you know, so hopefully we have a better sense of who's doing what. Um, and so I really appreciate you all, you three taking time today to present. Uh, I sort of knew what you all were doing, but I learned so much more about what you're doing. And I really appreciate that. It, it's awesome to see the details. Thank you, everyone who attended. Um, sorry, we don't have as much time for questions or discussion today, but it's because there's just so much awesome work happening. So that's always a good problem to have. Really appreciate you being here in, in any case. And we'll be in touch uh, about our next one, which I think our next talk is actually going to be in December. But instead of hosting our own, we're going to recommend people go to Denon's. Uh, and so I'll be I'll be in touch with information about the Denon Lunch and Learn <laughs> in December. And then we'll be back in the spring uh, for some more topical discussions. So thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon.